the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, it's interesting, I find myself in this OPAC High School cafeteria tonight, where I'm an alumni of the school system, K-12. to It's been 37 years since I had my last cafeteria meal in this place. Um, I got a good education in OPAC, huh? but I consider myself somewhat math challenged. It never interested me. But we're going to see shortly two examples of math, which I'm hoping either some accountants or some economists in the office can help me out with. I read something in a publication that really grabbed my attention. Um, it kind of sums up somewhat where we are. I'd like to read it to you. Um, the author concludes, the point being made is that the economy of the region is based upon a healthy, attractive, and sound lake. Damage to the lake, even so slightly, and you begin the degenerative process that harms every property owner and businessman in the area. Ruin the lake, and you ruin the area, and unfortunately, examples of this uh, type of degenerative reaction abound in our state, as we find along the Passaic, Hackensack, or Raritan riverbanks. We estimate a gross product in wages, rents, supplies, equipment, and interest at least $55 million generated in the area that would not be produced if it were not for the lake. Anybody remember reading that? Was it in the ledger? Was it in the Daily Record? Perhaps the Herald? Maybe on social media? You'd all be wrong. It's from the August 1976 edition of the Lake of Pacon Breeze, which is a publication around the lake. As I said, I math challenged. If it was worth $55 million in 1976, what's it worth today? I have no idea through the math. The, one of the early um, efforts to protect the lake was the Lake of Pacon Protect Association, which was active in the 1940s until it was absorbed into the Lake of Pacon Foundation shortly after that entity's founding. That agency um, did a lot for public education, for awareness. They advocated for the lake for many years. Uh, Cliff London, uh, former mayor of Pacon and regional planning board member, was an active participant in that. They produced a lot of inter interesting information, such as this boating is fun boating, safe boating is fun boating, for sure. But eventually they folded up. Um, shortly after that, we have the creation of the League of, actually, 1961 saw the report there that's on the screen. I'm going to ask Dr. Love now to click to the next page. That's a, uh, a um, report summarizing the need for a regional entity. Because don't forget, we have four towns, two counties, and a state of New Jersey that have something to do with this um, entity. So this is dated July 1st, 1961. It was addressed to all persons who are concerned about the lake. I have a copy of it over here. It's a whole pamphlet. I won't bore you with it. If you want to come up and thumb through it later, you can. Excuse me, Dr. Steinbaum. So again, it was a report, slide three. Um, it was addressed to um, the mayor's governing bodies in Lake Pack on area and the freeholders of Morris and Sussex counties. It went on and on to talk about the lake's problems and the need for a regional um, method to address those concerns. So we find ourselves then in the 1970s. Next slide, please. Slide four. So we have then Senator Dumont trying to deal with the weeds. He was working in 1974 to get $50,000 to address weeds. Here's a copy of the News Leader article from the era. Anybody remember that publication? Next slide, please. Oh, we have any, I have on the left, then Councilman Richard Hodson, and who's the guy on the right? I can tell you what, it's the very, very early Cliff London, working with another Save the Lake project. Next slide. Okay, here's Senator uh, Dumont to introduce another bill, July 1976, for additional weed funds. Okay, next slide. Then we had an entity called the Lake Pack Home Watershed Association. It was an active group for a number of years to, quote, maintain watershed protection, promote the restoration and conservation of all the natural resources of Lake Pack Home, and so on. Next slide, please. 
Meanwhile, the Lake of Pacon Regional Planning Board was still busy. They put out another rather large pamphlet, actually a booklet, Planning for an Inland Lake, talking about development, pressures, and other things which are detrimental to the lake, and recommendations to address it. Next slide, please. And then we have an article, and it was uh, in the uh, Daily Record, Monday, June 11, 1979. That was the first weed harvester that came to Lake Apacon. It was a prototype to show an alternative to chemicals. So that's when weed, start, weed harvesting took root. Shortly after that, the Regional Planning Board, I believe in 1984, got grants for three harvesters, ultimately they ended up with three harvesters, and they continued, they continued on with, the, with that. Then in 1980, next slide please, we had another outfit come along, and it was called the Lake of Patcom Preservation Group. In 1980, we had an issue with the pumping of the lake, the uh, water lines that are in place to pump water over the hill into the Rockaway River. This lake is supposed to be an emergency source of drinking water. I assume that means it should be clean. Um, so this group was active for a couple of years, and then it folded up. Next slide, please. Then we ended up in 1999. Um, at that point in time, I was on a regional planning board. We had three harvesters. If we were lucky, only one worked at a time. They had holes in them because they were regular steel. They were rotted. Uh, we got the idea that maybe we should put foam in them, flotation foam. Turned out that the flotation foam absorbed water, so that was a real crisis. Um, in 1999, their funding was delayed. There was grant money that was supposed to come. It never came. There was uh, many sections of the lake that were totally beach choked. It was said that navigation was almost impossible from Landing Channel to Bertrand's Island. So the Need Youth Club at that time activated its conservation committee consisting of Tim Clancy, I think he's here tonight, hopefully, um, Lou Tarasio, who we also saw here tonight, and Joe Tecula, Bill Weidman, and yours truly, and we were assisted by, of course, our web guy. The internet was kind of young at that stage, so he was a a godsend to us. Suffice it to say, and by the way, um, I don't want to get into the whole Save the Lake thing, but we did make uh, the bell pins or buttons. We had bumper stickers. We made up banners. Yeah, we went, we went all out with this. And if you go to the Need Deep Club's website, which is www.needheatclub.org, and you go into the Some History section, you can read all about it. Um, Suffice it to say that we came up with a comprehensive model of watershed management, projects, staff, and equipment, um, and so on. Uh, we appeared before many local government, community associations, local groups. Um, some of the members testified in Trenton for the creation of a Lake of Pacom Commission. Uh, we estimated in 1999 that it would take approximately $1.5 million a year to address all things in the Lake of Pacom Protection Act, such as weed harvesting, stormwater management, dredging, and so forth. Here's your second math question. If it was necessary to have $1.5 million in 1999, what's it worth in 2019? I don't know, maybe somebody could help us figure that out. So we have some additional slides. Go through those very quick. Um, shortly after the creation of the commission, a task force was created um, at the request of then Chairman Albanese. Um, we had to find enough work to keep the staff busy for 52 weeks a year. I think we more than did that. The work that we identified and the projects were so granular, granular, they were right down to what it would cost to retrofit a catch basin at that time. Getting block materials and so forth and all the supplies, $1,039.90, very granular. Next slide, please. There's a very young Tim Clancy on the right next to uh, former Commissioner Sam Hoagland. Um, this is again trying to get the commission going. They're standing in front of what else? The catch basin. Um, so, what the staff was supposed to do between the, the summer was weed harvesting. That was a no brainer. During the fall and the spring, they were supposed to be doing catch basin retrofits, um, mapping the stormwater management outfalls of the lake. Um, working with the towns and counties on a shared services agreement. And by the way, I expect that Dr. Love now will shortly show data that documents that lower phosphorus levels existed when the Lake of Pacon Commission was at its most active. So, next slide. 
So shortly after we got up and running, um, the money was cut. That's a 2003 article. One year we get $1.5 million, the next year we get nothing. I don't understand the rationale or reason. We're still trying to figure that out. Next slide. Kind of the same thing from the daily record, same time period. Next slide. We're gonna get to that in a little bit, but. So thanks to Senator Pucco, after this crisis happened, we had a series of cash infusions, I think $300,000 here, $400,000 there. We stumbled along at life support. Then we found creative methods to get some funding from the IBO grant, and we were looking at every nook and cranny under the couch cushion. And it was a slow down, downhill, and very agony, painful death spiral as the field staff was let go, and finally our administrator. So all meaningful activity at that point stopped cold. So during this period of 2000 and 2015, we saw a couple other groups pop up. One was the Lake of Pacom Alliance, which was in the late 2000s, uh, followed by the Lake of Pacom Foundation in 2012, which thankfully seems to have a very broad and strong root system, along with what I, I believe is staying power. A little over a year ago, in the waning days of the Christie administration, our local, our local legislators were able to secure $500,000 annually from the Motor Boat License Fund. It is still a far cry from having zero dollars, and it certainly rejuvenated us, but candidly, it is woefully inadequate to address all of the items in the Lake of Pacon Protection Act, which I again will indicate at the time in 1999 was estimated to be $1.5 million. So at the last meeting, I challenged audience members to literally walk up and down their streets and look into the catch basins. What did you see? Up on the screen is what a state-of-the-art catch basin looked like in 2002. Basically, on the right side, although you can't see it, there's supposed to be an inlet pipe. Whatever comes in is captured. There's a little snout, which is on the left-hand side. So all this sediment goes to the bottom, and only cleaner water goes out the outlet pipe. And at the time, we were advocating putting in um, absorbent pillows with um, phosphorus, I mean, um, um, help me out. Yeah. Yeah, iron oxide sleeves now they're upgraded but currently understand these pillows they're like essentially throwing dryer sheets in a the dryer they cost forty dollars a piece roughly is that right fred and what they do is they're designed to be suspended or hung in the catch basin and as the water comes through it's supposed to act like a magnet to pull in phosphorus which won't end up in the lake and won't end up causing weeds or algae so i'm going to quote tim clancy again i remember this vividly he said about weed harvesting. Weed harvesting is like you're itching yourself. Why am I, why am I... There we go. So Tim used to say, if I'm, I've got the itchy scratchies, you know, I'm, I scratch myself to relieve the itch, but what's going on here? It could be that I have psoriasis. So that's kind of like what it is with the lake, the algae, and the weeds are caused by nutrient loading, which is phosphorus. So you've got to arrest this stuff before it ends up in the hillside. So we need to get back to stuff like this, such as catch basin retrofits, mapping the outfalls, cleaning out the sediment deltas in the lake. We lost an opportunity last fall to do that. I know our local state park superintendent was trying to work and get us a statewide permit so that towns could go and clean it up. Unfortunately, the, got tied up in red tape, it never happened. Hopefully next time that can be fixed. So what has to happen now? We need an immediate, aggressive infusion of funding, and make no mistake, it has to be permanent this time. This is a wake-up call. We need to work um, from now until next spring to stop nutrient loading of Lake Pacum. Start at the water site basins and work up the hills. Hopefully this will pay dividends next summer so we don't have to deal with this again. Tonight's meeting is the result of a few of us Lake Pack Home Commission members getting together at a brief lunch last week with Dr. Lovedow and Marty Kane. And we wanted to put together a meeting for tonight to talk about short-term, mid-range, and long-term solutions. And what's really shocked me is it really didn't take that much effort. Um, it's kind of scary. We've done the hard work already in the form of studies, in the form of coming up with these programs, we know, we know what needs to be done for watershed management. It essentially boils down to one thing, and that's money. So in conclusion, I ask all of you to pay very close attention going forward. That means tonight, 
That means in January. Now, when we have our usual people that show up, like three or four people, this is something that when you're thinking about the holidays, you also need to be thinking about the lake. You need to be thinking about the following summer. So please get involved and advocate for Lake Attack Home at every turn. Thank you once again for coming out tonight. And I leave you again with this one final statement. We need your help. Thank you, thank you very much. Very good. Morning, Ken, you want to give us an update from the foundation? Today I really put on my historical hat. We have some a couple of things. And, and, and your, your real point tonight is we just didn't get here like because it happened this summer. There's a long history to how we got here, and there's a lot of missed opportunities along the way. And I think that was one of Dan's major points where if we had been funded at $1.5 million a year continuously over the last 10 years, we wouldn't have this bloom on the lake today. There is no doubt in my mind. Yes, a lot of this is nature caused, but it's also because we dropped the ball. And when I say we, it's not you people in the room, but we as a collective state have dropped the ball on this. Um, just a little bit out the lake, it's mostly things you know, but we figured we'd throw them up there anyway as long as we're throwing things. Probably the most important one up there is there's 2,200 homes on Lake Apacom. That's a lot of homes on one lake, and that's, you know, is one of the issues we have to deal with. And the fact that under 45% of the lake has sewers. You know, obviously that's a set, lot of septic loading that's going on in the lake, and certainly that combined with our stormwater management issues is putting a lot of food in for things like algae or bacteria. Um, the other thing I, I know Fred wanted me to make sure I mentioned is the amount of boats that use the lake. Hey, we all know on a Saturday or Sunday when the weather's good and all, there's a lot of boats out there. You go into Byron Cove, if, if you had predicted yesterday's weather on a normal Sunday in Byron Cove, you probably would have had close to 400 boats in there. We get a lot of boats on this lake. We try to share the lake as much as we can. We've made big efforts in that to kind of share the lake. And on a Saturday, Sunday, it can get very used, and it does stress out the lake to a lot of extent. But that's something we live with when you have a lake this size an hour from New York City. But I thought this was just really good, and I hope some of you can read it. But this is just really quotes going back from 1960 about the problems at Lake Apacom. Like I said, this issue did not just suddenly come about. Uh, we've had things, you know, uh, from 60, 83, 84, 86, and 93, just sample comments I just pulled out of different papers and uh, news articles, feature stories. Um, I know Cliff London likes to say like a lot of the problems in the lake, they reappear every 10 years. It's kind of like that with the lake, something causes us to reappear. And, and, and that's what you really have here. It's not like all of a sudden this happened. There's been a lot of warning signs. There's been a, a, just a lot of issues out there that we haven't probably paid the proper attention to. And Mother Nature threw the perfect conditions at us this year. Uh, to give us what we have out there now. But as you can see, I mean, in the 80s, they were still young. The Lego Packham Commission didn't come about by accident. It was because in recognition of the problems we had. Fred? I, people kind of like to say like, God, when did the lake ever shut down like this? And this kind of came up actually, but it did shut down in 1975. And this was because we kind of didn't get it right with the uh, herbicides on the lake. And they put in too much herbicides and they had to close the lake over the 4th of July weekend. Some of you old timers may remember that out there. And we certainly don't want to go back to that point where we're just dumping chemicals in the lake to try to fix problems. But that is what we were doing then. And, and you know, it wasn't accidentally that we got the weed harvesting. No one's saying that weed harvesting is a perfect solution to this problem. It was never meant to be. It was always meant to be an interim fix. It was like cutting that lawn out there so your neighbors don't bitch at you. You know, it, it, the whole idea was we didn't want to keep dumping lake-wide chemicals in. And a lot of people in recent years have said, hey, just throw the chemicals back in. It worked in the past. But there's a lot of other problems that come about from that. And I'll quote Mayor Francis, if you want to drink one of, the, one of those glasses with the chemicals in it, he'll be the first one to set you up. All right, please. All right, I'm, I stole Fred's chart. He sent it to me at like 2 in the morning last night. Thank you, Fred. And, and I, you, you can't look at this from a historical perspective and not 
look at these numbers. Okay, they're a little bit over. But look what happened when the Lake Opaco Commission really got going with their stormwater management efforts, and you see where we got in 2010. We were at like a really low level on the lake, and it had been going down three years in a row. We were all feeling good about ourselves, and then what happened? We stopped funding. And it kind of leveled out for a couple of years, and what have we seen pretty much every year since? The amount of phosphorus in the lake has gone up to the point where before this bloom started, Fred said, he goes, wow, this is the highest phosphorus count we've really ever seen in the lake since uh, Princeton Hydro was measuring. And what happens right after that? We get a, a large bloom on the lake. All right. So, I mean, so from the historical perspective, and that's all I was brought up for, was kind of give you a little bit of, it ain't a new problem, but the most important thing is, this time we gotta get the solution right. We can't just drop the ball halfway through. We've shown that we can do this. We've shown that the solutions are there, and we're gonna turn them over, but this time we have to follow through. And obviously, it's, it takes a big effort. There's gonna be a need for both state and federal support on this. I, it's thrilling to see so many of our elected officials in the room tonight, and their support is tremendously appreciated. But, you know, we can't kind of make that same mistake again. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm going to call now on Dr. Fred Lovnow to give us a summary of the current water conditions followed by our short-term, long-term mitigation strategies. Thank you. Um, and I promise, I only have 10 slides, okay? So, I want to hold more slides. So, let's see how I can do it. Sorry about that technical difficulty. So basically two components to this talk. The first, I'm going to provide some select water quality data that we've been collecting for this year. And then the second is I'm going to propose the four-point strategy, uh, which was, as previously mentioned, includes short-term, interim, and long-term recommendations. OK. So Marty already showed this slide. And it's sort of funny. This slide is essentially my career. I started as a consultant in the early 90s. Lake Apatcom was one of the first lakes I was working on. Look at them from 1990 to 2000. And that red bar you see shows the average phosphorus concentration that we want to be at or less. So when we have average phosphorus concentrations of 0 0.03 or lower, for the most part we have good water quality, not a lot of algae. And each one of those points represent an average of seven 
to nine surface water sampling stations. And you can see that through the 90s, we had some pretty high phosphorus concentrations. I can also say that we have had algae blooms like this in Lake Pacon in the past, but in the past they've been in select areas. This is the first time we've seen it where it was lake-wide. But you can see through the 90s, it was pretty erratic. 2000, when the commission was formed, and you look through the decades, from 2000 to 2010, phosphorus concentrations, for the most part, were below that 0 .03 threshold. And you, I went to most of those meetings, and the biggest complaints we had during that decade were too many weeds. A lot of weeds. Well, it's because when you have clearer water, when you have less algae, you'll get more weeds. But you know what? Most lake communities would rather deal with weed management than algae management because of exactly what's going on now. So when you look through the 2000s, when the commission had money, when they had full-time staff cleaning out those catch basins with the municipalities, with the shared service agreements, when harvesting was going full till, and then about halfway through that decade, the commission received a number of grants that totaled over $2 million. Two were from New Jersey DEP through the non-point source 319 program. One was from EPA, the targeted watershed grant, and another EPA grant went through DEP to the township of Jefferson where they developed their septic management plan. So they got an infusion halfway through the decade of about two million implemented a lot of projects, a lot of stormwater projects. Again, remember, those, those structures were being cleaned out by those shared service agreements. And then when you look toward the end of the decade, about 2008, when the recession hit, money was tight. And then when those grants were over, which was about 2015 when the last grant was completed, you can see what happened. Phosphorus concentrations started creeping up. We weren't continuing with the installation of the stormwater structures. We didn't have the staff doing the shared service agreements, cleaning out the catch basins, maintaining the stormwater infrastructure. You know, Jefferson was focused on their ordinance for uh, their pump outs, which is great, but something that we, we need to discuss sometime in the future is possibly sewer. You know, there are some other things that were coming up on the horizon, and even before the situation occurred in June, um, the Lake of Pacon Commission received a grant from the New Jersey Highlands Council to update the restoration plan. So the restoration plan was finalized in 2006. We realized it needed to be updated. Um, so we're working, we actually started working on that last year. We're wrapping up that plan. But I did want to emphasize, this graph is, is it's pretty telling that it's showing that when you don't have money, phosphorus goes up. When you have money and you're implementing those projects and you're controlling the phosphorus, phosphorus goes down. You have clearer water quality, you have clearer water, better water, less algae. So I'm just going to talk about some of the data that's been collected to date. So this is... I mentioned each one of those points is an average of about seven to nine stations. This is showing all of the stations. And the one thing I want to identify is if you look at the orange bar, which is June, almost every concentration was above 0 .03. And this is what I said about we were, we were concerned when we saw this, that concentrations around the lake were high, which when you look at that long-term database, that last data point for 2019, the average concentration in June was above 0 .04, 0 0.04. That's the first time in the 21st century that the concentration of phosphorus went above 0 .04. So that right there tells us more phosphorus, more algae. So again, going back to this, showing those phosphorus concentrations, I want to point out June had a lot of phosphorus. That's what triggered the bloom. That's one of the reasons why the bloom was found all around the lake and it started all along the edge. We also saw this in a lot of other lakes in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. Every lake was hit with a very similar type of bloom. The other point I want to make is Station 10, look at that June concentration is the highest at Orange Park. That station is just below the quarry stream. I do want to identify that. 
That, that is state, that's the most northern station. It's down gradient of the stream where the quarry is off. This is total phosphorus concentrations. Look at station 10. Now, none of these are above the water quality limit, the DEP water quality limit for TSS, total suspended solids, but you can see station 10 had the highest concentration of all of those stations. In addition to doing the in-lake monitoring uh, as part of updating the restoration plan, we've done some select stormwater monitoring. So the, now I'm, instead of sampling in the lake, now I'm talking about samples collected from streams. And uh, this is just showing we did two stormwater events in May. We did one in early July. D1 is that stream down gradient of the quarry. And that July concentration was very high. And the last water quality data I'm going to show you again, D1, this is total suspended solids. During the July event, we had high TSS concentrations from that stream down gradient of the quarry. So two things I want to identify. One is, you know, we have to do a little more investigation, but it looks like, you know, that stream is producing more phosphorus and TSS than the, than the other sites going into the lake. But number two, and this is, this is more critical, that it's not just one location. It's all around the lake. You know, we saw this by the elevated concentrations throughout the lake in May, in, in June, and we also saw this by the fact that we had that green ring start. The bloom started as a near shore bloom around the entire lake, not in just one area. So that is the water quality part. I'm now gonna wrap up talking about the four point strategy. The four point strategy, we, so we have four components here. The first component is to complete the revision of the watershed implementation plan. This is a long term goal. So the, the plan will be done in about a month or two, but the implementation is going to take years because there's a large number of projects listed under that. I can tell you the first restoration plan was, was finalized in 2006. We've implemented a wide variety of projects based on that, but we needed to update the plan. So that's the long-term measure. The next three are short to intermediate term. Short term I'm defining as happening basically now, this year. Interim would be sometime within the next year. So it's hard to tease those apart because it really depends on funding and implementation. But if we look at those, the first is, you know, identifying some near shore demonstration projects. So it's key that, you know, we've seen that the, this, this large scale bloom started by elevated phosphorus concentrations coming into those near shore areas and then blooming. What can we do? What sort of demonstration projects can we implement to reduce the phosphorus going into those near shore areas? So the beaches, the bays, the coves, the, uh, the homeowner association groups that are dealing with those blooms. Are there projects we can implement now and objectively evaluate to determine, is this something that's appropriate for other sites throughout the lake or should we look at something else? The third point is beach and cove restoration plans. And I really, this is something I sort of stole from New York State DEC. They've been um, pitching for their larger lakes that the, the beach and cove community should have their own little mini plans. That does two things. One is it gives um, ownership to the people who live and recreate in that area to say, okay, the whole watershed thing, we know that's important, we, we know we want to clear up the whole lake, but what can we do at our location? What projects either in the water or in our immediate drainage area for stormwater or septic can we do to improve conditions? So it, it gives them some empowerment on what they can do, number one, but number two, it also gives them responsibility to say, okay, you know what, you want to help? This is how you can pitch in to help the lake. It will help your little neck of the woods, but it will also help the lake in general as well. So those, those beach cove restoration plans, I think, are going to be very important. And then finally, you know, we've heard so many people bring up different ideas and concepts. Why don't, you, why don't you aerate the whole lake? Why don't you use alum? Why don't you dredge? 
if we're going to start asking questions like that, we really need to do some sort of scientific investigations. This is going to be really critical because I keep hearing people about talking about mixing the whole lake. Um, aeration can be very important and it could be very valuable for some of the nearshore areas, but based on the models we have, the internal load coming from the sediments only accounts for about 7% of the lake's phosphorus load. About 80% of its load comes from septic and from stormwater. But that's based on a model that's pretty old from the 80s. So one of the suggestions we're making is, is why don't we collect some empirical data, update and update the model, and quantify, actually quantify that internal load. Maybe it's larger now. I don't know. But without doing those scientific investigations, I can't say for sure. The other thing is, is the algae. Anytime we collect samples for algae, we're basically collecting them mid-lake and a net toe. Maybe we need to start collecting more discrete and a larger number of algae samples so that we can better predict when these blooms will occur. Do they occur in the open area as deep water blooms and come to the surface, or are they starting as these nearshore blooms, as the bloom that looked like it, that happened this year occurred? So those scientific investigations are very important. But again, for a four-point strategy, the first component is the long-term, and then the next three are those short-term to interim strategies. This is a very preliminary budget. Very preliminary budget. I have three million for the restoration plan. That's the long-term plan. That does not include any sort of septic or sewering. That's only identifying 26 large stormwater projects that we're recommending throughout the watershed. But again, keep in mind that we implemented uh, about 12 different stormwater projects with the $2 million that was received uh, a decade ago from both DEP and EPA. So we're looking at 26 stormwater projects for the long interim. Uh, personally, I, and again, I, I put this out there, having full-time staff, full-time staff that are really focused on weed harvesting, and this was previously mentioned, focusing on weed harvesting during the summer, Fall comes around, they winterize the equipment, then later in the fall and then into spring, they can do those catch basin cleanouts and all those stormwater structures that we're saying being installed, they should be also responsible for the clean out of those structures as well as a shared service agreement. That was very effective back in the 2000s in terms of removing the phosphorus and the solids. You know, doing that on a routine basis really helped to prevent those nutrients from going into the lake. I also have some budgets for a select group of beach restoration plans. Again, um, using some information from New York uh, State DEC, um, some demonstration projects, and some uh, specific scientific studies to answer some of the questions that have recently been raised. So in total, just for this budget that I have out there, it's $4 million. Now keep in mind that first one, that list of $3 million, a lot of that's going to be occurring over the long term. So I could see potential sources of funding coming in through grants or other sources of revenue. But really, that's a very preliminary budget. It does not include the weed harvesting. It does not include any conversations or studies associated with uh, sewering feasibility or septic management. Um, but it, this is something that, and I, I always emphasize this, this is everyone's job. It's the state, it's um, the towns, the counties, the communities, the people, the visitors. Everyone needs to pitch in for this to really be effective and go back to where people are complaining because the water is so clear and we're having to deal with aquatic plants and focusing on how to control and, and prevent them. So I think that is it. So close to making this smooth. And that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Penn. It's outstanding and very informative as usual. Um, at this point, I open the floor here to any of the Lake Packer commissioners who want to make a statement. Dr. Steinbaum, you on the end of the table. Is your first? Um, can I have the mic? 
Thank you. Um, I think what, 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 I'd like to, what I'd like to see you take home from, from this presentation is that um, the lake has always had problems. When I, uh, when I reviewed all the old things that were done in Dan McCarthy's law office, I couldn't believe it. It, it went back to the 30s. Uh, all the complaints were the same type of thing. They tried to fight it, and, and you heard about all the attempts. But the bottom line is, this is a state-owned lake. The state owns the lake. And the state, in my opinion, has never supported it properly. You saw the improvements that happened when they originally, in 2001, uh, granted the commission, uh, started the commission and granted it $3 million dollars of which a million and a half went for equipment and uh, the commission was supposed to get a million and a half dollars a year for operating expenses. Well that continued for one year and then as you heard it largely went by the board and the commission virtually almost ceased to exist. We lost all our employees, our administrator. We held meetings that were kind of bitch sessions and, and we really couldn't do much about it. Uh, at this point, we're getting $500,000, as you heard. 355000 of that money goes just for weed harvesting. So we have $145,000 to do everything else. Is that, is that unbelievable? So, uh, you know, this, we, we have to call on the state to come forth here with some funds and we have to jump on things that we can do immediately. And that's what we're hoping that all of you, with the help of all of you, can help us accomplish. Thank you. I'm Mark Crowley. I've been on this commission about four years. I've heard the same things, the same struggle. And I want to thank you all, first, for coming out tonight. And second is for the presenters. Uh, it encapsulated what I've heard for the last four years. And, and nothing's really changed. Fred has been telling us and giving us these numbers. As, as Fred has said here, we have been spending money on doing management reports and trying to understand what it is, but we don't have the funds to go ahead and start to really work on those reports. Hopefully this is the beginning of that. Thank you. Just real quick, I'm one of the new guys on the block. I serve as the old commissioner for Morris County, and uh, I'll just speak as a commissioner now and mayor later. But I want to thank personally, first, everybody for coming out. Um, obviously, everybody's very concerned, as, as I am as a lifelong resident here at the lake. But I want to thank um, uh, Dan McCarthy and Fred Steinbaum, um, and also uh, Fred Love now for uh, the due diligence that they truly put into this. There's, uh, I've attended a few meetings with them all, and they, they are truly passionate, they know the history, they know what needs to be done, and you're hearing the same theme over and over again, we need the money. So hopefully we can make that happen and, and, and make something that's negative turn it into a positive, hopefully. Just a brief update since I last spoke. A woman was kind enough to hand me this um, blue post-it it says 55 million in 1976 is worth 243 million in 2018, and 1.5 million in 1999 is worth 2.2 million in 2018. So that's at least what one person said. So I invite you all to do the math. Hi, my name is Bob Tessier. I'm on the Rangers Committee, and uh, the board keeps going to and presenting at all the local zoning boards and planning boards, but they keep granting impermanent coverage, variances, and other intensifications in the shoreline. So that's something I think that everybody needs to work on. It's really a problem that relates to the stormwater, the municipalities, the two counties, the state government, the commission, everyone has to and the residents as to all pull together and put something in the pot to really address this. Um, the future is not going to be very bad. My name is Joel Servas and I represent Sussex County. 
And uh, it's just great to see this kind of uh, attendance here tonight. This is something very, we're usually seeing maybe less than 10 people most of the week. And I have little to say beyond what's already been said. So I'm just happy to see a crowd like this. Thank you, and just to you know, summarize, I'm, I'm glad that the commission members themselves in the last month or so, we've really come together closer than we were before, and we did a lot of research, and, and Colleen has held it all together. She's the group that held this all together. So I want to thank everybody that had any input into this and for your concern out there, because if we're not all concerned, nothing's going to happen here. We're going to make something happen, I promise. So I'm going to get to the public comment portion, but I'm going to recognize state officials first and then some county officials and local officials before I get to the general public. So I know that there's any legislators here, any senator, I, I see Amy's here representing Senator Bupo. Is there any Senate people there? Who? Senator Pinaccio, do you have anything you'd like to contribute? Good luck. <laughs> All right, the assembly, I saw Assemblyman Buko was here. Assemblyman, anything you'd like to add? Okay. Any other assembly persons here? That's okay. As a past member, coach? as a past member on the, um, the PACON Commission, where I sat for DCA and now as a legislator, I'm looking forward to working with all of you on all the things that I knew, even through Roxbury Township and all the years I was there, there's a lot of work, but that means everybody needs to be working together. And I know that my colleagues down in uh, the State House and I here from Morris County um, and from Sussex are gonna make sure that uh, we hold the state responsible to help us where we need the help. I can tell you, if the state of New Jersey can give $4 million out of appropriations for Wildwood for tourism this year, then why can't we have $4 million for Lake and Pack Hop? So, I'm sure they're all going to work together, we are, to make sure uh, we press that issue and work hard for that. Thank you. Thank you, Betty Lou. Um, I just want to say two things. One is I want to thank the Commission and the foundation for um, initiating the process of preparing a long-term and short-term plan. I think we need to take this problem on ourselves in terms of developing a solution that will help the legislators be able to pitch that solution to the state to get the adequate funding that is necessary. So I want to thank you for the work that you've done so far. And the other thing is that this is a state asset. And if the state doesn't take responsibility for it, um, there could be long-term implications for that. We've seen that in other areas, not only of the state, but in the country, where there's been natural disasters and the impacts year after year from not having addressed it immediately um, have long-term problems developed. You know, we don't want the future of this lake for people to look at it and say, I'm not bringing my boat there next year. You know, the state hasn't done anything to make sure that this problem isn't going to happen again. We want to make sure that the message that gets sent out, not only around the two counties, but around the state, is that we are doing what we need to do to make this state, this lake healthy again. So that people will be here, people will spend their money here, and people will recreate on the lake again. Because that's what's most important. And the state needs to step up and take responsibility for that. You know, I'm, I'm glad that they're here now doing the testing. But quite frankly, all the money that they're spending now, if they would have spent it in the beginning, we wouldn't be here spending that money today. So um, I know that each of the legislators that are here tonight, uh, this is critically important to us. Um, my father and I worked very hard to get the $500,000 uh, through the budget so that we harvesting can continue. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Now it's time to put the state's feet to the fire to make sure that they adequately fund this lake to 
It's their responsibility. It is their lane. And quite frankly, if they ignore it, they will be spending 10 times more every year, just like they are now, to try to correct something that's already occurred that they could have prevented. So I thank you. We are here to support you. And we will work with you on finding a long, a short and long-term solution to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I, I know this is very important to everyone in the community. Um, last week, I was in D.C. and had the opportunity to ask a question from uh, a panelist and including somebody from the GPA. And the answer that I got was not only from that person, but for many other people in the audience who have experienced this in their own communities over many years. So I hear what you're saying about doing the studies, but it seems that there's a considerable amount of information out there for us to capitalize on. So when we're talking about the money and the time that is going to be used for these studies, I think we can leap ahead and really do something to bring this forward as quickly as possible to relieve the burden on all of the citizens in this area. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank everybody. I especially want to thank uh, the commissioners. Anybody that sits on a governing body or a board like this, it's a it's a double-edged sword. Most of your meetings you're conducting, you're working hard, you're doing your own volunteers, and doing the work, and nobody's in the audience. Uh, when everybody's in the audience, it's a good thing, but there's usually a problem, and that's that's a bad thing. Uh, from the county's perspective, I just want to let you know, and our county engineer Chris Vitz is here attending. Um, I've been on the DEP calls. I was at the last meeting. The county maintains seven roads around the lake. Uh, we regularly clean the catch basins. We regularly sweep the streets, as do all of our municipalities. That's required by G DEP regulation. So is the septic maintenance that's required by uh, DEP for our municipalities on septic systems. And I believe Roxbury and Mount Arlington are sewered around the lake. So I think that here on the ground level, uh, we're doing our job. Uh, good news is we know what the problem is. It's phosphorus loading. I also uh, was chair of lakes management in Mountain Lakes for seven years, so I understand, obviously, a much bigger lake, but uh, I understand uh, what's going on here. And today, we are so much further ahead than where we were in 2006 when the study was done. We are much more cognizant of what needs to be done. In 2011, the governor passed, I think, one of the most stringent fertilizer ordinances uh, in the country. Uh, here for New Jersey. So those are all good things. So I'm glad to hear the study's being redone because uh, a lot has changed since 2006. And I think it's changed for the better. We're much more aware and we understand what the problem is. And we know how to fix it. We need the money. That's been said you know, time and time again. So it's key to get the new study done. I think the old study in 2006 called for a 40% reduction in the total maximum daily load of phosphorus. So I don't know where we are on that. We're, we, we've hit about 33%. So, so that's good. So we've made progress. Yeah. So uh, so I think we also have to keep in mind you know, the good news here. Um, bad news is the state's uh, not coming up with the money for the state lake, but I know we have our legislators working on that. So uh, once again, I just want to let you know the county's also here for your support. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, mayors, I'll go last. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Stanislaus, the mayor from Mount Arlington. Um, this is a great opportunity for us mayors to get to know each other a lot better. The four towns have come together like the four families of the Cosa Nostra for a sit down, and uh, we had a good sit down with our posteriors, and we're really working together uh, really closely to make this thing get better. The towns are doing everything they can. I just have one point or one question is why is our threshold so much more stringent than other states around the country? Um, you know, it's 20,000 parts per milliliter as opposed to 70 or 100,000 in other places. And uh, I think we should take a look at the reason why that is. I, I can answer that. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Um, so just to let, just to let you know, uh, the threshold is 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. That's the average concentration we want in Lake Packham. Um, that's the phosphorus. That's the phosphorus, yeah. Total phosphorus. 
Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Um, that I can't, that I, I can't answer. The only thing I can answer with that. I, actually, let me just say one thing. Let me, let me just say one thing. That when you look at EPA and World Health Organization, they have a probability of having exposure to cyanotoxins. And the 15,000, um, no, I'm sorry, the 20,000 is, is for moderate. It's, it's a moderate level of exposure. Right here. Sorry about that. I thought you were talking about, ph I have phosphorus on the brain. Okay. Phosphorus is important too. Um, I'm Leslie McGeorge. I'm the administrator of the Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring at DEP. Sorry, I will repeat myself. Thank you. I'm Leslie McGeorge, the administrator of the Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring at New Jersey DEP. I provided a presentation here, was that last week? Two weeks ago. Thank you. I'm Ms. Bloom. Um, and um, the, are, the state has a harmful algal bloom recreational strategy that was developed by many programs in DEP, the New Jersey Department of Health, and the Department of Agriculture, and developed to um, have guidelines for protection. And we have two kinds of guidelines, and the one that was just brought up was the cell count guideline. Um, this is a cell count to prevent irritative effects from contact with the water when you're swimming. And that number was derived uh, from the World Health Organization, which is part of the United Nations, um, say on bacteria cell count numbers. And as Fred said, it's advice to pre prevent um, impacts from contact with the cells, and it is considered a, to protect against a moderate level of risk. Um, there are different states you use different levels. Some are more interested in just protecting at a high level of risk. We think it's appropriate to provide advice at a moderate level of risk. So we, along with Kansas, Kentucky, Virginia, and Wyoming, are using the 20,000 cells per milliliter. So there are states that use the same number that we use, and there are states that use uh, the higher level of risk up to 100,000. Um, again, this is advice. So we think it's appropriate to share with the public advice about a moderate level of risk so that we are being protective and we share with you what we know about that. This is, this is advice. This is not an adopted standard. 2017, New Jersey developed its harmful algal bloom recreational strategy. It was put on our website at that time and we began responding to harmful algal blooms at that time. About 10 other states have gotten to that point to have um, considered uh, strategies that are uniform across state agencies and that have a predictive way of responding to a strategy. So again, this is advice. It is not a standard, it's advice. And that goes along with um, the other side of our, stand, our advice relates to the cyanotoxins that can be produced by these organisms. And the cyanotoxins can produce a number of health effects um, all the way up to uh, effects on liver, kidney, and nervous systems. In this particular bloom, we have seen cyanotoxins being produced, but not above the levels of our advisory levels for toxins. I'm sorry. I think we're not. We're, we're, let's not do. It. Let's finish up the elected officials, and then you come up for public comment. Uh, Roxbury, for Mike and Young. Gorgeous. Thanks, uh, Bob D. Local from Roxbury. I want to thank the commission for giving us another opportunity to uh, to learn more about what we can do, and I'm, I'm particularly impressed with the, the plan going forward. I do want to thank um, uh, Senator Bucco and Senator Panaccio, Senator McCroach. I mean, I participate in, in these these meetings of stakeholders for the mayors and local officials, and I will assure you they are holding the state's feet to the fire on this. And one of the things that I think in terms of short-term solutions that we've been talking about now for weeks is the state needs to monitor more frequently. And, and where the lake is safe, the lake should be opened again, uh, and uh, and our legislators are hoping to, to get to that place. 
we did hear some things from the QEP that that may, that might happen, but I, I, I think we really need to be more precise and be able to open the lake where the lake is safe. And then finally, <laughs> finally, I, I, I feel like I'm compelled to tell you that yes, Roxbury is fully sewered, except in one place, the state park. <laughs> the state park is not sewered. So, thank you. <laughs> I know Mayor Francis is here. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to a pack. Uh, normally I wouldn't say anything I mean like this, but, but tonight I will. Look around this room, you look up look up front here, and you listen to Marty and Fred. Uh, we have a lot of brain power, a lot of technical knowledge around here. And then you look at our lake and you say, what's the disconnect here? Uh, I I, I talk to our people in town all the time, uh, most of the time at the different galleries and whatnot, because that's where you get the real pulse of the community. And so people are frustrated, angry, impatient, don't understand what's going on, and, and, and the chain of information that our people are getting is that on its best day, not good. Um, and so what's the answer to that? Um, and I'm not going to beat up on the DEP uh, because they're, they have they have some of the brightest people, technically, that you'd ever want to meet. But the bureaucracy stinks, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I can tell you some experiences. We talk about the weeds on the lake, and I'll tell you a story about the weeds. The Lake Foundation, myself, has spent two years trying to introduce Trikeway Grass Park to our lake. We have models. We don't. We don't. We don't do scientific study. We go look and see where it's working. And so the Lake Foundation took a, a field trip with myself and some of their staff to Candlewood Lake in Connecticut, twice the size of the lake at Pacon. This is their fourth year with Tricoid Grass Park. And when you travel on their lake, you don't see, you see very few surface weeds. The weeds are about three or four feet down. The, the point I'm making here is that we, we didn't ask the state to do studies. We didn't ask them to pay for studies. We did, we went and found a model, and it went nowhere. After two years, they finally said, well, no, we're not gonna let you do it, in invasive species. But the striped bass and and, uh, and muskies and all the other channel catfish that were put in our lake, and they're not natives to our lake. Uh, Triploid grass park or sterile, live five years and die in eight weeks. Uh, so there's mathematical models, that lakes have uh, abused them and didn't do it right, but if you use the right model, they're very effective, it's another tool. So that, that's all about the weeds. And, and, and so I believe that the, the DEP failed us on that. They did. Yes, they did. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so you know, and, and, you know uh, we, we talk about this uh, algal bloom. Well, I did a little study on Lake Carmen in Vermont. It's not quite as big as our lake. It's only about 1,600 acres or 1,400 acres. But I spoke to the, to the town clerk this morning about how their lake is doing. And, they've, uh, and, and their lake was probably as bad as ours. All their tests are coming up. They're passing. And one was a little bit elevated for the uh, cyanobacteria. And they use aeration, uh, an aeration methodology, and they also dose the lake with, uh, with good bacteria. Because the problem with, you know, there's been a steep learning curve, so I just read all, all about this stuff. And so, uh, when your good bacteria are present, the cyanobacteria uh, take a back seat, if you will. And so, there is a working model. And so, I appreciate the science of it all, but take a look at what's working. I mean, we're, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Take a look at lakes similar to ours, and, and what happened when they tried it? Try something. Don't say, well, we'll wait till it end. That just, that is, just confuses people, it frustrates people, and at, at, we're at a cyanobacteria at a moderate level, that's closed our lake down. It's crushed our businesses. It is, when I talk to the businesses all around the lake, including the marinas, they're dying. And so, you know, if, if we have to take a look at that, and I'm not suggesting that we endanger people's health. But are we really at the level that we're at? That, that's a simple question. And so I'm not convinced 
that, like our previous mayor said, we shouldn't be opening parts of the lake. I know the cyano, uh, cyanobacteria will tend to move from place to place, but the cyanotoxins, the ones that are really harmful, are still below our level. So it begs the question, though, why is our lake closed to contact? I, 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 can't, I can't answer that. But I can speak for our people, I can speak for our economy, and I can also speak for our infrastructure. Yeah, great. Uh, and so, the federal government is talking about all about infrastructure. State government talks about infrastructure. Well, now we have uh, the proposal that lakefront septics are adding to the problem. Give us some money and we'll sort a lakefront. All right? And so that takes care of that argument, or at least a piece of it. So there's a whole bunch of pieces that I learned with that. And by the way, it starts with our woods. It starts with our woodland management. It starts with our watershed. What are we doing with it? The last time the DEP tried something, to their credit, they almost had a, had a civil war in Sparta. But let me tell you something about the DEP's forest management. It's about one of the best around. It's not in the country. So that, I'll give them credit for that. You know, on one hand, I whack the DEP around. And on the other hand, they have some pretty bright people if they're allowed to do their job. And what I learned from my experience with the DEP is that when you deal with a bureaucrat, the easiest thing they can tell you is no, because they have rules. They take out their rule book and they say, nope, not allowed, no. And that's the end of the argument. And you can't argue anymore with that. But, but I believe there are answers to our lake. I believe there are short-term strategies that we can use to get our lake back. But for heaven's sake, let's get, let's get going on it and stop, stop already with this and, and do something, at least if you're trying to do something, and the frustration that the people I talk to is nothing being done. What's being done? What, what are we doing about it? Turn your aerators on. Turn your, turn your ice eaters on. For crying out loud, try something. But there are, there are uh, methodologies that are very formal that can treat this. So if you don't like it, tell me you reviewed it and you don't like it. Go talk to these people that are using it. These are working models. This is not a study. This is a real situation with these people actually using it. There, there are circulators that you can do. Take a look at them. Go look at the lakes that use them. How is it working for you? But we don't have to do year-long studies. You can do a field trip and talk to the people. The people that live there will tell you the truth. They will. And that's what we found when we go to Candlewood Lake. You go to Lake Heritage, by Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They're using aeration and, and the, uh, uh, the dosage of the, of the good bacteria. It's only about a 200 acre lake or 300 lake. But the point is, it was a swamp. And now it's clear water with great fishing. Hello? So, so let's take a look at what works. I mean, I, I, I hate to be simplistic, but I have to tell you, we have the brain to do this. We have the, we just have to have desire, and we got to hold our, our friends and friends feet to the fire again, and, and you can take that back. That there's good and there's bad. I want to amplify the good, and, and the, let's just put the bad on the side, okay? Stop with this, well, well, we don't know, or we have a rule book. And by the way, what I found out with, with rules, is it's not legislated, they're rules. You don't like the rule, change it for crying out loud. So that's, I'm sorry, but I can go on about our way. Now, I gotta follow that. I'm the new mayor in Jefferson Township. I'm on the job seven months. Uh, but I'm a lifelong resident of Jefferson, and uh, at the last meeting, uh, I was kind of challenged a little bit as far as sewers. Uh, Jefferson was is one of the last, as well as the Pacon, some of the Pacon sewer. Jefferson is not. In the 90s, as everybody knows, there was a lot of money available for sewers. Uh, there's very little now. I want to thank Congresswoman Shirell, who came up here on Friday. Uh, we did challenge her to uh, find some funding, if possible, uh, because I, I want to thank Tim Clancy. Tim Clancy is is a champion of the lake. Um, he's been extremely helpful to me, guiding me in a lot of things. Um, Tim, Tim knew, unbeknownst to me, I work in the police department, so I'm a law enforcement guy. I'm not a uh, environment, environmentalist biologist by any stretch of the imagination. But Tim knew that in Jefferson, we had done a study in 2002, and he knew enough to, to uh, uh, request that study, which is probably you know a couple Bibles thick, and he's been in up at the municipal building poring over that. And I know he's put together just a few you know a few facts for me, 
um, that I can take back and hopefully maybe get something going. But in 2002, the cost to, Je to sewer parts of Jefferson Township, the lakefront, about 3,300 dwellings, uh, was 61 million. Uh, right now, we're up to, if we were to do it in today's money, it would be about 85 million. So obviously, the cost is growing. Um, that kind of money can't be borne just on the residents, of course, can afford it. So we really need to find funding, as, as you've heard from other mayors, our infrastructure, our infrastructure. We're hearing where the phosphorus is coming from. Jefferson, at least, did septic management. It is a help. It is not the solution. So we really need to go forward with you know our infrastructure. A lot of what Fred Lovnow has said as far as some of these implementation points. Uh, but I, I, I think you know we're, we're all these studies have been done. Is that I'm the new guy on the commission. I've only been on a few years. I'm one of the alternate. But I sit at these meetings, and there's been a lot of work done by a lot of wonderful people who really care deeply about our lake. And as you hear what history is telling us, it comes up over and over. We're talking about the same things going back, you know, 100 years. So now it's time to hopefully do something to get these plans in place and finally get our lake in good health. Thank you. Thank you. Any other elected officials? John Marshall from the Governor, Governor's office. Governor, I'm sorry. Congressman, Con Congressman Malinowski's office. Here you go. That's real money. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is uh, John Marshall from Congressman Malinowski's office, and I'm Michelle Droulis. I'm the Congressman's district director. Um, we have been on all the DEP calls uh, listening to the issue. Um, the Congressman did want to share with you that um, he, he understands the needs of our municipalities. Um, he did fight for an additional $1.8 billion in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Uh, that money is dedicated um, to a wide variety of projects that help protect, maintain, and improve water quality. Um, and so we are looking at the needs that our local municipalities as well as our counties that our state have and how the federal government can partner. So thank you for uh, allowing us to be here. Uh, thank you. Any other elected officials or state uh Offices, county, here you go. How are you doing? Uh, Jim McDonald, the health officer for Sussex County. A um, couple questions, and I think uh, the doctor uh, tried to answer this. Uh, one of the questions posed to me by one of my questions posed by our freeholders: Would dredging assist? And I think you said it's only seven percent of the soil of, of the, the bed, so probably dredging would not be a solution uh, for the phosphorus problem. Um, dr typically, dredging is something that's done. Once you have a lot of your pollutants in the watershed under control, so I know like 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 for EPA funding for dredging, EPA will tend to give funding for dredging once you address the majority of your watershed. So, like I said, we've hit about 33 percent. If you were close to 80 or 90, then you can go for funding for dredging, but what the state and federal agencies don't want to do is they don't want to give money for dredging and you haven't taken care of your watershed, and then two to three years later you get heavy sediment loads coming back in. So that's why they really want you to focus on the watershed before dredging. Dredging is sort of like the, the project that comes in towards the end of these plans when you're like, okay, we've taken care of the source, now let's attack these shallow areas with this accumulated material. Um, I guess uh, we do have representatives from the DEP here. Um, with respect to the wall uh, water analysis, the beaches, we're getting feedback from our beaches that they have been passing, um, and so we're getting questions. I am not receiving any copies of results, maybe some of my staff are, I don't believe we are, but I, I'd like to make sure that we're on the same page as to what uh, the results are for our areas, and then so that we also have the same messages for our beaches uh, as to why we're not gonna let them open if they are having results below the threshold and whether that's accurate or not um, with respect to the beaches in question. Okay, um, uh, Wild Shores, Pebble Beach, Sand Harbor were the, the beaches that were saying that they had results that passed. Hi, I'm Bruce Strengthen. I'm the Director of Water Monitoring and Standards at DEP. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, I want to just thank everybody. I mean, the amount of passion in this room is amazing. 
Um, I want to assure you that we're doing everything we can to try to get the lake open as soon as possible. We don't want to keep this advisory in effect one day longer than it needs to, but we have to balance public health and the economy and a, and a need for recreation on the lake. So it's a tough balance. But we've done monitoring every Tuesday and Thursday. We've done the flights. We have two monitoring buoys that are installed, one USGS, one by DEP that's collecting data every 15 minutes, including phycocyanin data, which is indicative of uh, blue-green algae. And we're looking at that data every day, and we're assessing where we are. And there are large portions of the lake where we feel like we're close. And then this weekend happens where we have a number of days of near 100 degree heat cooking that lake. And we want to wait and see what the next round of data says. And then we have the ride over here, I mean, torrential downpour. I mean, Mother Nature is not cooperating. I'll just say that. We have problems with phosphorus, we have problems with nutrients. There's a lot of issues, things that need to be addressed, and there's a lot of good short and long-term solutions that we can implement. But this, this weather pattern that we're currently in has really exacerbated the problem. So what we're doing, we have a plan to move forward, and we would like to move forward, and we're waiting for the results on Tuesday. And if the results on Tuesday confirm or continue the trend that we're seeing, which is a lot of the open waters of Lake Pacon being below those advisory levels, we're ready to move forward on lifting the partial, uh, partially lifting the advisory for a large portion of the lake. Uh, there are a number. Thank you. We'll put that on the sides. The pack on open. Yep. All right. So. Yeah. So. Um, the only thing, a number of the coves, um, and I'll, I'll just mention them, a number of the coves are still showing high levels of cell counts and are still producing toxins. What, what coves are they? Excuse me? What coves have the high levels? Yeah, I'm just say. So we're looking at Byron Cove. We're not seeing any real improvement. We're not seeing any real improvement in Crescent Cove and River Stitch. Um, we're not seeing any real improvement down by Lake Pacon State Park. Uh, and we're not seeing real improvement near Henderson Cove. If I say that already, I'm sorry if I did. Those areas look like they're gonna remain um, under advisory for a longer period of time. Um, it's due to a lot of reasons. But I can just wanted to come out here and assure you that there's no, we do not want to keep this lake under advisory for a day longer than we have to. We want to work with you on finding solutions um, we want to work with Fred and Princeton Hydro and the Commission to implement some of these short-term solutions. Um, I, I already reached out to Fred about you know, possibly funding some demonstration projects. We spoke to our commissioner this morning about that possibility, and it's on, it's on the table. So we're going to work with you. We're going to try to get things going. Thank you. Thank you. Your purpose was to make a statement, not to start a floor debate. So, um, is there any other uh, work on the TEP? You want to make a short presentation? You have something you'd like to present to us? Hi, I'm Michelle Putnam. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Water Resources. You can't hear me? Okay. How's that? Okay. I'm Michelle Putnam. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Water Resource Management. So I get the pleasure of working with Bruce and Leslie and all these people. We have the Stormwater Program, Nancy's here. We've got our Finance Program, Charles Jenkins is here, and Carrie that most of you know from our government services. And I have to just reiterate what Bruce was saying. It's really great to see so many people that are interested. I was really interested in the history and how long we've all been working together and want to continue to work together on this issue. And it is a long-term issue. It didn't get here yesterday. We're not going to resolve it tomorrow, but we are. I'm happy that Bruce is able to share some of the more positive results we're seeing. Um, we're going to also test the beaches on Tuesday, so hopefully we'll have good news overall. 
We're working with Fred. Um, you know, you've talked about infrastructure management and maintenance, which is so important for so much of this. You talked about sewering, about infrastructure improvements. You know, it was mentioned about the state revolving fund program and the funding that's provided under the Clean Water Act. That program is administered by us. So a lot of these projects that he brought up, those three million for stormwater, they could be eligible for both 319H grants that you talked about how much they've helped over the years. Those are grant monies but also we have low interest loan monies for infrastructure improvements. So I just wanted to say we're here, we are working really hard, we want to work with all of you um, to help solve this problem and get the lake back. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other organizations represented here tonight that want to make a brief statement? Yes, sir. Thank you, my name is Elliot Ruga. I'm with the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. And uh, we're very, we see the lake as one of the most important resources in the state of New Jersey and its contribution to the economy of, Northern, of the Highlands is incredibly important. So we want to help out how we can. And in light of that, we are putting together a public information session for August 20th at the Roxbury Performing Arts Center. And we've gathered some of the most recognized experts in lake management, in um, stormwater, and um, um, aquatic ecology, including uh, Stephen Souza, who's formerly Fred LeBeau's boss at Princeton Hydro, and um, James Cosgrove from um, Omni uh, uh, Nederlander, and we have um, Chris Abrupta, all PhDs, all engineers. Chris Abrupta is one of the leading experts in the state on stormwater management. So if people have, still have questions, people want answers, these are the people to ask. There's an information flyer on the table as you exit. And we're doing this in um, cooperation with the New Jersey League of Conservation Works. So I hope you'll come in. Thank you. Is there any other organizations here that want to make a new state? Okay, so I'm now uh, going to open up to the public. We're going to limit your, your presentation to two minutes, so be concise. Try not to repeat yourself. There's a lot of people want to be heard, and so I want to give everybody a chance. Nobody can speak twice until everybody has spoken once. Okay. Rhonda? <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to know if it's Ice cream will float. Ice cream will float. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> I'm just curious as to uh, why all of the be I'm hearing murmurs behind me that the beaches are not closed, the lake is not closed, but they are, and it's just advice that coming from the DEP that, that we shouldn't be swimming, so why is the signage on Route 80 saying absolutely no contact with the water? Yeah. Yeah. Why are we required to have signage that says no swimming and no contact with the pack on until further notice if it's just advice? Hello, my name is Blanca Sheprest, I'm the superintendent technically of Sportswood State Park, but right now also we'll pack on. Uh, the advisory um, is for the lake. The beaches, including the state beach, is mandated to close if there's a sign of a suspected hab, uh, which is what we're required to do. And the health department also requires that any other regulated beach also close as well. The advisory is for the rest of the lake. Use 
in the rest of the lake. The signage that you're seeing on the highways is specifically for Hopakon State Park. No swimming at Hopakon State Park. Say that. Okay. Well, we will have to look into that because the, the, the signage is supposed to say Hopakon State Park, no swimming. At one, at one point it said Hopakon State Park was closed. The park is not closed. It's just closed to swimming. The park is open for every other use. Um, but that, that goes for all the other swimming areas as well, but not the entire lake. something from Governor Murphy, who was on Ask Questions to the, the Governor tonight. Um, no, he did not at all address this issue. None of the questions that were forwarded were answered. But he had a saying, and he said it time and time again. It was nobody bats a thousand. So relax. It's okay if you made a mistake. Nobody bats a thousand. Leslie, I apologize. I didn't get your last name, so I'm going to play by Leslie. He just quoted that Kansas, Kentucky, a whole bunch of other places were in line with Jersey. Let me read you right from the, the Kansas webpage. They have a three-stage warning. Public Health Watch, a warning, and a shutdown, and a reason as follows. A Public Health Watch, the earliest one, will be issued when the microcystin toxin concentration is detectable at a concentration of four micrograms per liter to less than 20 micrograms per liter or cyanobacteria counts are, dramatic pause, 80,000 to less than 250,000. Yeah. The signs do not say the park. The signs say don't touch the water. It's okay, guys. I said it last week. When we saw the bloom, I would have done the exact same thing. I would have shut it down. I would have made the announcements. But all the data says the opposite, right? I used to keep my boat on Greenwood Lake. I guess I could just drive that up to the northern side of the lake, right, where New York is kind of looking and smiling. Yeah. Nobody bats a thousand. It's okay. Straighten out the signage, and we can all get behind everything that's needed to be done here to straighten the lake out. Thank you. My name is Maria Robano and I have lived on Lake Opacon almost my whole life. Way back, they used to use an airplane to spray the whole lake to kill all the weeds. Nobody died, the fish survived, there was plenty of fishing, and there were no weeds. The water was blue and beautiful. The way I'm looking at things right now, the DEP is really good at testing, but they're not really good at getting anything done to fix yeah. the problem. Yeah. And I am sick about it. My whole life is around this lake in the summertime. I want to swim. I want to be on my paddleboard. I want to swim a couple times a day. I don't even turn my air conditioning on so that I can get hot enough to jump in because I love it so much. And I can't do that. I feel trapped in my own home. As far as the money goes, the state has a responsibility to the homeowners of Lake Opatcon, especially the ones that live on the water, because somewhere down the line they did some creative financing, accounting, and they changed the whole tax system so that, excuse me, I'm talking, they changed the whole tax system so that the people who live on the water have to pay a surcharge. My taxes went up almost 33% in one year for the privilege. Not only did I not even pay for that privilege, but now I have to pay extra in taxes, 33% for the privilege of living on the lake that I can't even use. Because you guys are not doing your job. You all know how this happens, and you let it happen over and over again. And now you're talking about a long-term solution? You have a solution. That man, I don't know his name, who talked about the carp. 
put that carp in the water and let it eat the weeds. And, rega and regarding the, the, the weed harvesting, I know everybody's doing a really good job, okay? But I sit at my house and I watch those weed harvesters go back and forth. I'm just going to finish this sentence. Those weed harvesters go back and forth pulling up nothing for hours. The only way they're effective is if they come near the shore and they don't want to come near the shore because they don't know the lake and they don't know how deep it is and then they have to go dump the weeds off more often. It's a big fat waste of money and a waste of time. And why doesn't the state park have septic? Why is that? I had to pay for my septic. I had to pay for my septic and I pay $350 every quarter for the septic that somebody else made me pay for. Why isn't everybody else paying for it? Why isn't the state park paying it for their fair share? By the way, there's no payoff on those septic systems. My name's John Tucci, and I'm with Everblue Lakes, um, and uh, we're a company, we're, we're the most successful natural lake restoration co company uh, in the country. I did not solicit to be here, I was asked to come here and share my ideas, but I had an old boss one time, and I came in and I had a great idea, and I said, boss, I got a great idea, and he said, yeah, show me how it'll work or why it'll work. I said, well, trust me, it'll work. He said, son, in God we trust, all others bring data. And so that taught me a lesson when I was asked to look at Lake Hepatcong, I went into the data, and I do think there is a core impairment of this lake that needs to be looked at uh, and is evident in the existing data. So how many folks have heard of the Mississippi Gulf dead zone? That's the algae factory that is closing the Mississippi beaches all along the coast of the, south, uh, of, the, of the Gulf Coast right now. And how many of you heard of the Lake Hepatcong dead zone? The data that I reviewed shows that the lake is basically out of oxygen at about 20 feet. And today I was out with a DO probe and was able to do my own measure and discovered that yes, the lake is virtually out of oxygen between 15 and 20 feet. Now, I agree with everything that's presented about what needs to be done for this lake, short term and long term, but I also believe that if you don't look deeper into this core impairment, because it, this is where the algae is most likely breeding, there's a lot of good science that shows that these dead zones are the algae factories for these water bodies. And that if you, you do not address that problem, you will be going in circles for many years. And so I was asked to be here to share my ideas based on some data. I'm not saying that that is the full answer by any means, but we've got some information over there if you're interested, and we'd be happy to help as we were asked to be here. I think I find wine, but I mentioned it off today and I think I can get away with it. I have a question for DEP. How many people were here at the last meeting? Okay, I asked DEP if the quarry is possibly a potential source for this. I was told it was very important and we got stunned like they never heard of it before, which isn't true. And then I spoke to the DEP compliance last week. They have yet to test the quarry stream for water or sediment. I'm very, very disturbed. I'm going to share this picture with you. Keep printing these big pictures. I don't know what you do with them here. Right. And I'm going to show it and pass one around for people to see. There is a long-term problem at Lake Apacon. We discussed all these issues. We have to address it. Sores and stormwater is all important. This picture shows the quarry detention basin now. As we know, there was a quarry incident that them a lot of material in the lake, and it's my belief because the threads data, highest phosphorus ever in 17 years, highest spot right in front of this quarry, and I'm gonna pass this to the commission, and you guys look at this. That's the detention basin, it's pea green. Explain to me, because there's no septic up there, 
There's no storm water, there's no fertilizer. Why don't we have the data and why hasn't it been tested yet? Yeah. We really need an answer. We're, we're sitting here saying there's point source and not point. If there's a point source that tipped us over the top, last meeting you said that something is out of bounds, maybe the out of bounds that put us over the top on this, or maybe it's not. We don't know till you test it. What is the difficulty? We are going to test it. Oh, we are. Two oh, weeks oh, later. Oh, 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 oh. We so, reported it February 8th. So, I'm, I'm so frustrated. I'm just going to hand the mic and maybe you can explain it because we've discussed this tomorrow, since February. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. Being tomorrow. tested tomorrow. tomorrow. That's, I, I was in the private sector. We couldn't run our businesses like this. In terms of the potential source of phosphorus in the quarry, um, the commissioner is taking this very seriously. She was at the last meeting, uh, went back to the department, and gathered a good number of experts in the department, particularly the geologists in our New Jersey Geological Survey, to evaluate the rock type and the potential for it to be contributing any phosphorus. The conclusion of the expert geologists is that as far as a phosphorus source, it is a very, 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 very minor source of phosphorus in the, that rock. That does not mean that we are not interested in following up and doing the requested testing. Um, I think last time you did hear that uh, Fish and Wildlife had done testing in that brook. My uh, Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring is going out tomorrow at the Commissioner's request, and we are going to be doing other biological testing, macroinvertebrate testing to look at the condition of the stream, as well as nutrient testing, including phosphorus, in the water column. So we will have that data after tomorrow. John Persman, um, I, I'm a homeowner in Lake Pacon also. So this is from Lake Apacon News. It's the Memorial Day issue of Lake Apacon News. And in there they show the white cloud that covered Wardport Bay. What do you think happens when light doesn't penetrate the water? It's textbook. You get algae. You kill off the vegetation. I was at the meeting in June prior to the algae when I said Woodport Bay looked like death. Other people spoke how the birds were gone. I just spoke to a scientist that said it's not just the phosphorus we should be looking for in that quarry. We should be looking. We should consider that the chemicals that it would have released will most likely bind to the metals, copper, iron, magnesium, and other things that are in the water that normally help protect the lake. So not only did we kill the vegetation and cause the vegetation to turn into nutrients itself. But when you look at phosphorus or anything in the lake, normally the vegetation is the immune system of the lake. I mean, when it rains, your pool gets algae normally, but you use chemicals. The lake doesn't use chemicals. The lake, the lake uses its life. And we've killed the life for a major part of the lake, and then it spreads out. So I called the DP on my drive up. Um, the day the algae bloom was announced that the lake was being closed for contact, I called the DP, I said, look, if you were there in February, and I already heard the letters about how you were finding the quarry, you must have data about what's coming down that stream. I asked for the information about what they measured coming down the stream. I'm still waiting for it. So I'm not looking for data from today. I'm looking for data from February, March, and April when they were doing all this analysis of the quarry. Because if you have a major feed into the quarry, I mean into the lake, what was it about? Um, I, I, I'll go around for my next talk, you know, you said we could talk later, but I just want to know how many people know what stage the lake is even in? Are we yellow or red? Because this comes right out of the New Jersey DP manual. We need some clear information constantly. Thank you. My name is Lou Tarasio. I live in Woodford Cove. On February 8th, Tim Clancy called me and said, have you seen a stream up here coming from the quarry? It runs under Prospect Point Road. I said, no. I went up there and I met him, and I spent the next three weeks 
taken almost 170 pictures, drone videos, stills, everything anybody has seen in the paper, on the Channel 4 news feed that we did. February 8th, I stand on my dock, which I look at the pipe that runs under the road, it comes from the quarry. I have no weeds in my coat. I have no ducks, I have no geese. There's no oxygen, nothing's living in there. February 8th, ladies and gentlemen, and we're gonna take samples tomorrow. Yeah. Go. Is that okay? Please. Hi, my name is Mara Mose, and um, I go to the meetings. I'm in the PACCOM. Well, the quarry came up. I requested an environmental impact statement. Every time I do, I'm turned down. People do not show up at the meetings. Many things are passed, especially at the land use board. They're memorialized. Impossible. The first one is what is being done to remedy the situation now? Second, if reports of the balloon started as posted on June 17, why was no action taken before that time? Why is the state always reactive instead of being proactive? Number three, since signing of the rain tax in March, what measures have been taken to avoid such eligible blooms? Number four, why has there been no dredging, water skimming, nor introduction of any herbicide to stop the balloon? Number five, how many people have reported skin rash or other symptoms in contact with the water. Number six, what about the air quality from the evaporation of the dangerous water? Number seven, will we have a solution or plan in place to keep this from reoccurring or just more idle rhetoric? Thank you for your time, that's all I have. Hi, um, my name is Mike Brito. I live on Elma Point. Um, I just have two questions. Number one, in terms of the water testing that's going on, I look at the DEP website and I see a lot of beaches where it's not, and when you um, want to adjust the pH, you throw things like calcium and other items. And so that's totally different from phosphorus and those items could be coming from water as well. Thank you. I am Bruce Friedman again, DEP. I just want to address the beach testing. The reason initially we tested a number of beaches because it was complaint based. We got reports, they came in, we went out, we took a look at the beach, we confirmed that there was a, what looked like a harmful algal bloom, then we took a sample. We came back, we analyzed the sample, we saw that the cell counts were high, it was producing toxins but below the, the standard. Um, we, are not, we didn't go back and sample all those beaches over and over again. We were sampling representative monitoring locations throughout the lake. Once those levels in an area, geographic area, are below that 20,000, then we'll go out and we'll sample the beaches. So we're planning on going out tomorrow and sampling all 16, I believe it's 16, right, Leslie? 17. 16 or 17 licensed public or licensed uh, recreational beaches in on Lake Backon. So we'll have those results on Wednesday. If uh, the area is lit, uh, within the beach is at, if we lift the advisory of that area and you come up with two tests, we'll open the beach up. So hopefully, if the tests are good on Tuesday, we'll be out again on Wednesday when we sample on Wednesday or Thursday. There's a capacity issue. We only have so many staff to go out and sample. It's also lab capacity issues, but we're gonna get this done. And we're gonna get the beaches and the lake reopened as soon as possible. Um, as far as the pH goes, um, I just wanted to note if you look at our um, continuous monitoring website, you can see the printouts. The pH right now in the lake is about nine, eight and a half to nine, which is very high. And that's indicative of an ongoing algal bloom. Uh, there's a lot of data. I was looking back at some of the uh, uh, Princeton Hydro data from years past. 
And in the summer, we typically, in a um, cove or an area that is having an algal bloom, we'll see super saturation of DO, dissolved oxygen, and we'll have high pH levels. And that's both indicative of an ongoing algal bloom. We continue to see the readouts of um, dissolved oxygen and pH that, that are indicative of a healthy algal biomass. And, and I know Frank can confirm that. Our economy is a part of the pleasure of living here and actually impact our environment of living long lasting life. It seems there's a very high stakes game going on here, and it's really very scary. One of the things that's happened in the last year is bipartisan legislation that people are joking with calling the rain tax, but it's also our thought's purpose was watershed management, which I thought was the issue we spent the first third of this meeting discussing. I don't think it's funny to call it a rain tax. When our lake is dying, there are no birds, and we're losing our economy and our housing property values are going down again. So I'd like the commission members, if they could take a moment, explain to me as a voter whether or not this law is a good idea, why it's a good idea, and would help with your continued funding for that first third of the meeting we spent talking about those issues. Would that funding mitigate some of the spending issues that you have? Would you be receiving them? Would part of that money stay in our community? And by the way, Helmworth's called it rain tax and said it was just worthless. My town's not worthless, my lake's not worthless, and my birds are not worthless. anybody's name when you're coming up so if you can speak slowly what your name is so I can get it for the record that's and I'll just say on the stormwater utilities though that's a town by town decision each town would have to really look at look at that separately there's no opaque on why solution to that each town will look at it so if you're interested talk to your town hello everybody my name is Teresa Guarino I'm the resident of um, Landing and um, I'm a nurse and I'm a little confused because I keep hearing that the toxin levels are below a hazardous level. However, we keep hearing that this is a harmful algae bloom. I've looked, I've read about this, I've looked it up. I can't find any information about do the toxins degrade? What happens?